Hello friends, uh, so we are back in the MOOCs course on fundamentals of nuclear power generation and it is a quite hot afternoon outside at Guwahati which welcomes you to the 12th and the last week of the course. Over last 11 weeks we have discussed about different aspects of nuclear power generation, some of the modules or some of the weeks were quite theoretical in nature like uh, when we discussed about the fundamentals of the nuclear power generation, the source of nuclear energy. Uh, different types of nuclear neutron interaction, the fission and fusion reactions etcetera, whereas some other lectures or some of the other modules were more uh, practical in nature like different types of nuclear reactors we have discussed. We have discussed about the fusion technology and also in recent weeks we have talked about additional factors like the safety aspects of nuclear reactors and also the radiation effects on uh, living beings particularly. So, we have more or less covered all the aspects that you need to know to have some basic idea about the nuclear power generation and uh, only a small part that is left to finish up the course which we are going to do in during today's lecture and also the one that is going to follow. And uh, to end this particular course of course, we are going to discuss about something where everything ends that is the topic of waste management. Waste probably uh, you are very much aware about with this term it refers to something that is of being, that is not having any kind of value and therefore we need to get rid of this similarly in nuclear plants also waste uh, definitely refers to the spent fuel and also quite a few other kinds of resources which uh, we can't use for any further nuclear power generation and hence we need to dispose that now, waste management not only for nuclear, but in any other kind of power generation also that is of uh, a huge concern. Like if you think about a coal based power station, the waste that we get from coal based power stations are uh, fly ashes and the bottom ashes. Handling bottom ashes is not that difficult because we can convert the bottom ash to some kind of slurry form and then uh, use some kind of hydraulic transport to store take that to some kind of storage location. But fly ash is uh, very very difficult to handle like if you have experience of visiting any power station thermal power station that is or maybe in the neighborhood area you will probably find that in a uh, in a general uh, size power plant uh, around if we uh, draw a circle an imaginary circle of something like say 8 10 kilometer radius taking that plant itself as the origin or the center then you will find the entire area being covered by fly ashes. It is a real menace the handling the fly ash. There are definitely lots of uh, environmental regulations and protection acts which uh, requires the plants to treat the fly ash uh, instead of uh, disposing that to the atmosphere and uh, different agencies are trying different kind of disposal like some of the agencies are trying to make bricks out of those fly ashes. Some of the agencies are trying to use that fly ash for production of cements and similar kind of other materials. But uh, just think about say 500 megawatt thermal power plant, coal based thermal power plant can produce a few tons of fly ash every day and handling such huge quantity of waste is not a matter of joke. The additional factor in nuclear plant is that definitely we are going to have waste, but also we can't convert that uh, waste to any kind of form like the bricks or cements that I just mentioned about because they may have some kind of radioactive nucleus in inside also. And therefore, even for the waste also you need to be careful about the possible radiation hazards it may cause and hence we need some kind of special technology to store and dispose the nuclear waste. In fact, disposal and storage of nuclear waste is probably the most discussed about term whenever uh, we discuss the probability of setting up a nuclear power plant. Like uh, there is a common, no, uh, common notion among general public that the waste that we get from nuclear plants are uh, of infinite life and they are going to lead to radiation hazards for infinity which is actually not true. Again from the very beginning what I am uh, repeatedly telling uh, that kind of uh, notion can be partially attributed to the lack of knowledge and in this module whatever we are going to discuss I am just going to touch upon different ways of managing the nuclear waste and after uh, understanding these concepts probably you will be able to be in a good position to explain uh, to the common public about what are the real hazards that nuclear waste can produce and uh, exactly what are the common practice that presently we use to curb such kind of menace. 
but before we go to the waste management issues we need to remember a few points these are points which are associated with those uh, common belief of general public firstly nuclear power is the only large scale energy production technology which takes full responsibility of all the waste and ensures that they are all properly disposed of which is not done by any other kind of power stations be it uh, coal based thermal or be it gas turbines or whatever they always uh, leave a huge amount of waste to the environment without bothering about the environmental regulations but in nuclear 100% of the waste are taken care of the amount of waste generated by a nuclear power plant is also very small compared to other thermal electricity generation technologies this is somewhat related to the amount of energy that we get from uh, say 1 gram of uranium and 1 gram of coal we have compared it very early in our course and uh, we have seen that the energy that we get from the same quantity of these two fuels from uranium or from nuclear fuel we get something of the order of 10 to the power 6 or 10 to the power 7 times larger than what we get from coal correspondingly the amount of waste production also will be significantly smaller from two plants of similar capacity the nuclear fuel or nuclear waste rather which uh, comes out that can also be used as a resource by the breeding technology we can always convert uh, some part of this nuclear waste to uh, generate some further fuel like earlier we have seen uh, the reprocessing and uh, replenishment technologies that we use by virtue of that we can always recover a part of the spent fuel to produce new uranium oxides or even sometimes the mox the mixed oxides uh, and also certain cases the nuclear waste can be used for some other kind of applications as well some other kind of industries sometimes for research purposes so whatever comes out of a plant everything is not waste rather that can also have some kind of values or technical values i should say nuclear waste is neither particularly hazardous nor hard to manage relative to other toxic industrial wastes lots of uh, industrial plant uh, uses some kind of hazardous chemicals some very corrosive acids or alkaline agents and uh, just dispose of the, uh, that to the environment maybe to the corporation uh, sewage systems maybe to the river which leads to huge amount of environmental pollutions that is uh, not at all valid for a nuclear power plant uh, because the chemical effects are minimal and also even the radiation effects also can properly be taken care of and finally, the disposal method for high level radioactive wastes are very well developed. Uh, as per the modern technology, we are in a very good position to handle the high level radioactive waste. What we mean by high level, I shall be coming shortly. But for the moment, you can uh, consider that the strongest possible radioactive waste or the most hazardous radioactive waste also can be taken care of properly by the present day technology and also there is uh, international consensus about which one to use and which one is not that much suitable how to treat different kinds of waste materials there is a good amount of consensus uh, geological disposal is generally considered to be the best option we shall be coming that to short come to that shortly so whenever you are discussing or you are participating in, in any kind of uh, discussion regarding the management of nuclear waste these are the points that we should always remember uh, and try to stress upon that it is uh, not that uh, the waste that we get from nuclear power plant are going to cause huge amount of public uh, issues. Now, what do we mean by radioactive waste? In order to know the sources of radioactive waste, we also need to know what we are referring by this particular term. Here, uh, by using the term radioactive waste, we are referring to the materials which contain certain uh, a portion of radioactive atoms but the radioactive level, radioactivity level of those atoms or co the combination of those atoms are so small that that does not have any kind of potential from nuclear energy point of view or even from research point of view as well. So, the radioactive waste definitely contains some amount of radioactive nucleus which can go for further radioactive decay thereby releasing uh, both ionizing radiation and also energy. But the amount of radiation that we are getting from these waste materials are uh, not at all sig of significant amount they does not have any kind of they do not have any kind of potential to be used as uh, any kind of nuclear fuel or even in any other industries also then only we are calling that as a waste as long as it has even the smallest possible potential available we would like to use that 
Uh, so, radioactive waste may be just natural substances such as uranium ore residues with certain radioactive isotopes of radium and red radon. Uh, it can also contain some fission products, some uh, products of which has very high neutron capture cross section like those neutron poisons. It can also contain isotopes of those like cobalt and plutonium and definitely fission products can be there. Fission products themselves are radioactive in nature, so they can go through series of radioactive decays fine to get converted to some kind of stable isotopes at the end of the chain. Now, radioactive waste we can uh, get from different stages of the fuel cycle and also from a few other possible sources. Like mining of uranium is probably the biggest source of radioactive waste. We shall be coming to that shortly, but uh, you can get the idea say if you are talking about coal from the mine we do not get the coal directly. It is not that whatever we harness from the mine that can be directly fed to a coal based power station or any other application where coal is used. Rather, uh, we generally get coal uh, coupled with uh, rocks and some other kind of materials. So, by using some kind of chemical or mechanical treatment procedure, we have to separate out the coal and then only we can apply that to the industries. And the same is applicable to any kind of nuclear fuel like uranium as well lots of unwanted material that also comes out during mining and that constitutes a large fraction of the radioactive waste. Next is the fuel processing and fabrication part. From that uh, uranium earlier you have seen the fuel cycle For after mining we go through the process of uh, enrichment and uh, after doing the enrichment we go for the production of fuel itself. During this entire processing period we can have lots of different kinds of nuclei produced which can act as radioactive waste. The operation of the reactor itself which uh, probably from our visualization point of view the most uh, common kind of uh, waste. This is just the counterpart of the ash that we get from a coal based plant. That is once we have uh, loaded the reactor with certain amount of fuel say certain type of fuel may be say uh, natural uranium only. At the end of the process while initially there was 0 0.7 percent uranium 235 at the end of the process or end of the operation of the reactor also you will find there will be small fraction of uranium 235 left. Uh, but that amount may be so low that it is not going to affect uh, significantly the operation or operating zone or also it is not going to it is not suitable enough to harness some kind of power from that. So, we need to get rid of that and that also can be a very high level radioactive waste. The reprocessing and recycling of the spent fuel during the reprocessing also we get lots of isotopes being separating out which uh, may be radioactive in nature. And final decommissioning and dismantling of plant once the life of a plant is over like earlier we have seen the generation 2 reactors are expected to have a life cycle life period of uh, 40 years some of them are still working to something like 50 years whereas the generation 3 reactors are expected to have a lifespan of something around 60 years. But once that lifespan is over then the plant needs to be completely dismantled and during this dismantling procedure there is a large chance of spreading of radioactivity to the neighboring areas. Now, next is radio pharmaceuticals. We have already seen how the medical industry is increasingly depending on radiation based sources. Earlier we used to have only x-ray x-rays through which the radiation was used, but now there are several other kind of techniques also where radio isotopes are regularly used. And uh, whenever we are using those kind of radiation based medicines at the end of the process that also will lead to some kind of radioactive waste. Next is the radionuclides which are used in some other industries and also for research purposes in different research labs and the nuclear weapon program which is probably the biggest source of uh, the most hazardous radioactive nucleuses or nuclei that we can get. Finally, the clean up of contaminated site like if we have done some kind of uh, accident involved some kind of experiment I should say involving uh, nuclear material or using some kind of radioactive nuclei or if there is some kind of because of uh, the wire, uh, wire kind of situation if some nuclear weapons are employed to some certain kind of places then at the end of the day we have to clean that so that uh, the common uh, human life is restored. And uh, to do that we have to clean up the contaminated side and during the clean up process also the persons who are involved in this cleaning operation may get uh, affected by the radiation and also the entire neighboring areas also can get accepted or uh, can get affected. These are certain uh, isotopes which are commonly found in the radioactive waste. Some of them are uh, 
very long leaf fission products or some of them are medium leaf fission products. Here one important thing the unit of this half life is m a where m a refers to mega enum or uh, 10 to the power 6 enums. So, whatever number we are getting in this column that need to be multiplied with 10 to the power 6. Like iodine 129 is having a half life of 15.7 10 to the power 6 uh, years which is an extremely long period to talk about. But there are certain other isotopes which are having um, a smaller half life like uh, this particular isotope of tin is having a half life of only 0.23 years and uh, cesium 135 can have 2.3 into 10 to the power 6 years sorry tin 126 is 0 0.23 into 10 to the power 6 years. Uh, also the medium Lee isotopes which uh, half life are uh, smaller than this some of the medium Lee isotopes the here the unit is year itself. So, like uh, krypton 85 is having a half life of only 10.76 seconds whereas, even the longest one in this reach is uh, 151 samarium 151 which is about 96.6 years. And uh, as per the generation 3 concepts the expected life period of a nuclear plant is something around the range of 60 years. So, you can see apart from the last one all of them are having a life period within that. Next we need to classify the radioactive wastes. Different countries use the, their own method of classification like the method way radioactive wastes are classified in US that is quite different from the way it is done in UK. Um, but uh, to get a more generalized idea actually in all these different classification process you will find similar kind of terminology is used, but the way they are quantified that can be different. But to, to avoid any kind of confusion we are following the classification proposed by IAEA that is International Atomic Energy Agency which is the international body related to the atomic energy and it has several nuclear powered countries as its member including India and United States and uh, UN UK. So, the classification IAEA has provided according to that we can classify radioactive waste into 6 categories and the first one of them is exempt waste or EW. This is the waste which can be treated just as normal uh, waste. It uh, the radioactive effect that we may have some from this kind of uh, waste materials are uh, well below the corresponding clearance limit and therefore, they can be treated just like we treat the fly ash from a coal based power plant. Next is very short lived waste. It involves the waste which contains radioisotopes which decays over a very short period of time. That is the half life of this radioisotopes may be in the range of just 1 or 2 years and therefore, within limited period of a few years they can completely get destroyed and uh, subsequently this uh, shortly waste material will get converted to the exempt waste. That is we need to provide a quite small period of containment during which all the radioisotopes present in the waste material will get decayed to a stable nuclei and then we do not need to provide any further containment it can be treated like normal wastes. Then we have very low level wastes. Very low level wastes uh, refers to those kind of waste materials which does not uh, meet the criteria of exempt waste, but also it does not need a high level of containment and isolation and therefore, we can dispose it with uh, quite less amount of effect. So, radiation dose is there but the radiation dose that is coming out from this very low level waste are generally very very small and therefore we quite uh, close to the ground we are quite close to the uh, close to the surface of the earth we can uh, dispose this waste with uh, some while following certain regulations uh, generally this kind of waste involves soil and rubble of with low level of activity concentration and the concentrations of long lived radionuclides in vl lw are generally very very limited. This now we have the low level waste. This low level waste probably comprises about 90 percent of the total radioactive waste that we may have, but the radiation dose that is contributed by this uh, very low level waste that is uh, just of the order of 5 percent of what we have uh, globally from the radioactive waste. So, uh, under this low level waste category we can have several kinds of isotopes with uh, limited long life limited half lives they go through the containment procedure for a few hundred years 
and then and we can uh, dispose these containers uh, in a near surface facility quite similar to the low, very low level waste. A broad range of waste comes under this category which includes which can have both kind of options. It can have uh, short lived radioisotopes with very high level of activity whereas, it can also contain uh, long lived radioisotopes with quite limited activity. And generally that is measured by a, this kind of uh, parameters 12 uh, giga becquerel per ton of beta gamma activity. That is during the uh, radioactive decay of the corresponding radioisotopes it will go through either beta or gamma decay or maybe bo both as both together and the total amount of radiation that we are receiving from this uh, should be less than 12 giga becquerel per ton of beta gamma activity. Sometimes it is also uh, written as 4 giga becquerel per ton of alpha activity. That is uh, whatever amount of energy release or radiation dose that we get corresponding to one alpha radiation. In terms of that if we compare 4 giga becquerel per ton of uh, energy uh, that will be released by this low level waste. Next is the intermediate level waste. These are again the waste that requires a greater degree of containment isolation than that is provided by the near surface disposal. However, their temperature is independent of their uh, temperature or I should say the energy released by them are generally quite small to be considered and therefore, this intermediate level waste are considered or the storage the way we treat this intermediate level waste they are uh, those storage were designed only considering the radiation effect, but not the thermal effect. Generally the heat dissipation is limited to less 2 kilowatt per meter cube or 2 kilowatt per unit volume of the waste material and as long as the radioactive effect is significant, but the thermal energy release is less than this we can call that an in intermediate level waste. And finally, we have the high level waste, waste which level of activity concentration high enough to generate significant quantities of heat by the radioactive decay process or sometimes the waste with large amount of long lived radioisotopes that need to be considered in the division of disposal facilities need to be properly designed and now the near surface disposal will not work rather this kind of waste need to be disposed several hundred meters underground. The total volume of high level waste that we get may be just about 3 percent of the total radioactive waste or the high and intermediate level waste that combined to something like 10 percent where remaining 90 percent comes from low level waste or very short very low level waste, but uh, the total radioactive dose that we are getting um, general, maybe this high level waste itself can contribute more than 60 percent. Now, this is a nuclear fuel cycle this is a diagram which you have seen earlier also. This refers to different kind of processes the uranium goes through since the mining of the uranium from the coal or from the ore from the mines. Now, fraction of uranium that we get from the ore is very small typically of the order of 1 percent by mass in certain cases it can be as high as 20 percent, but generally it is less than 1 percent. And the mechanical and chemical treatment is done in the milling. So, for the mining it goes to the milling process you have learned again where it receives some kind of mechanical and chemical treatment and that uh, uranium is separated in the form of uranium oxide U 3 O 8. This is conventionally called the yellow cake which you have heard earlier also. And the yellow cake the concentration of uranium can be as high as 80 percent or even higher in certain situations. Huge quantity of residues left after milling is known as the mill tailings which generally is a sandy waste material. So, this is the first kind of radioactive waste that we are getting. Actually the term mill tailings is a com quite common term uh, related to uh, any kind of mining activities whatever left in the mine uh, after getting the targeted material is can be called a radio uh, the mill tailings. But here you are talking about a radioactive mill tailings and hence we need to be careful about handling this mill tailings. But uh, the issue is that total amount of uranium in core is very small, but due through this residue process we can uh, increase the percentage of uranium in that yellow cake that is that uf 6 to something as high as 80 to 90 percent. Sorry, I am not sure exactly I told the correct thing or not that is why I am repeating again. So, the uranium that we get from the ore 
the fraction is quite small less than 1 percent typically. Uh, it can be as low as something like 0.3 percent, but after processing in the milling we get the yellow cake where its concentration can be more than 80 percent. But what is left after this milling process that is from here that is what we are concerned about which is the mill tailings. Uh, mill tailings count comprises of about 5 percent of the original uranium and the daughter products of uranium decay chain mainly uranium 238 because in natural isotopes at least uh, uranium 238 comprises uh, more than 99 percent of the total volume more uh, so as 19 more than 99 percent is uranium 238. So, most of the isotopes that you get are because of the decay of uranium 238 itself something like uh, radium 226, radon 222 and certain isotopes of polonium they can all appear there. Accordingly, it carries more than 85 percent of ores original radioactivity. And also there can be several kinds of processed chemical residues which were used during the chemical procedure in the during the milling process and also a wide range of heavy materials. Uh, certain long lived isotopes such as thorium 234 uh, it has quite or I should say short lived their half life is quite short like for thorium 234 half life is something like 24 days. Therefore, they can decay very quickly and just after a period of 24 days or maybe a month. So, during their uh, procedures over this period of uh, say one month their radioactive effect is completely gone and then its total level of radioactivity can get reduced to 75 percent of the original volume. Certain other isotopes like uranium 234 and thorium 230 are very very long half life of the order of 10 to the power 7, 10 to the power 8 years and hence uh, th th their radiological effect will last forever. And this is another source of uh, or another significant source of radioactive waste disposal or radioactive waste generation I should say that is a heap leach recovery process. While conventional uranium is uh, harnessed from the ore sometimes uh, you the stone the stones which are supposed to contain small amount of uranium or I should say instead of stone certain slabs of stones with very small uranium fraction are put in a pile like this or they are heaped into a pile like this and then some kind of acid is supplied on the top on the effect of the acid the portion of these rocks that melted and that comes out through this part into the collection basin and from the collection basin that goes through three kinds of. So, after the heap leach process is done we get a liquid or we get two different kinds of liquid one which can be uh, rich in uranium, but the other one which is having a significant amount of waste material is leaving left there. When the as the ore is crushed during the conventional milling process the size of the particles will be quite small of the order range of 70 to 75 micron. But uh, in this process we are thinking about just harnessing the material from slabs and therefore while in the during the milling process we can get size of the order of a few microns here the sizes of the particles will be much much larger something in the range of 20 millimeter. And these piles are also left over above the ground on some prepared permeable pads. So, they can have severe kind of radioactive damage. These are the different types of tailings that we can get. The sand and slime based tailings generally come from the milling process where the sorry and the liquid one comes most from the heap leach technology. As you can see here the most important part for the sand based case the total radioactivity that is involved is 26 to 100 pico curie of radium 226 and 70 to 600 pci of thorium 230. Whereas, when you compare that with the liquid thing then the total level of radioactivity that we are getting is 20 to 75000 pico, pico curie of radium 226 and 2020000 of pico curie of thorium 230. So, there is a significant level of difference in the radioactivity that is contained by the corresponding mill tailings and hence the way we dispose the sand or slime type of uh, mill tailings that has to be different with the way we treat the liquid ones. These are the possible hazards that we may have from the tailings. We can have radon acceleration, gamma radiation, the trailing material can get blown away by the dust accordingly the dust wherever it falls will spread radioactivity there. The failure of the dam lead to spreading of radioactivity again because of some flood or any kind of natural calamity. And also the tailing materials or corresponding chemicals can seep through this bottom surface 
and can get absorbed into this area. There are several very very hazardous uh, elements like uranium and arsenic that can uh, seep through this and can go to the ground water thereby getting spread to the entire community. Radon particularly is uh, extremely dangerous to have these are the different ways radon can enter a house and then cause different kind of radioactive effects. Uh, particularly the effect of radon is to cause, uh, cause carcinogen see uh, that is cancer and such kind of carcinogenic disease are actually increasingly common like this is a data from United States um, where we, have we can found that the amount of people dying because of the lung cancer caused by the radon is more compared to the number of lung driving. So, it is definitely a very very big concern to deal with. Arsenic is another uh, particle of consideration. Arsenic 74 can decay in either direction, it can either form, it can either suffer an increase in the atomic number accordingly we can have the formation of uh, selenium 74 or we can have formation of germanium 74 depending upon what kind of reaction that is happening. And the effect of arsenic on the community can be classified into two categories oxidative DNA damage and assessment of activation of transcription factor can lead to the alteration in the gene expression whereas, the oxidative DNA damage can lead to chromosomal aberration and on also interface with cellular signal all of them and leading to carcinogenicity. And therefore, the radiation effect from arsenic should be very very uh, carefully uh, con captured. The gamma rays uh, I could have shown this slide earlier also in earlier module, but this one I kept here. Uh, gamma ray again they are generally interacts with matter in three different ways depending upon its own energy level. Like when the energy level is small we get photoelectric effect like the gamma ray is coming it is striking one electron and transferring entire of its energy to the electron. So, that the electron uh, can go out of this atom with the same amount or out of this nucleus I should say with the same amount of energy the plasma in supply is. The second case is Compton scattering. Here the energy level of this incoming photon x-ray photon is shown here, but the same is applicable for gamma photon also. Here it transfers a part of this energy to the outgoing electron and it continues as a photon with lesser energy which we call the Compton scattering. And finance the pair production when the energy level is quite high then the photon when the energy level is quite uh, large then it can lead to the formation of one electron and one positron. Now, electron and positron both are having extremely small mass of the level of 10 to the minus 31 kg or 10 to the minus 4 amu. So, this electron and positron formation from this photon which we are calling pair production is an example of energy to mass conversion. And also uh, the photon that we are having here that need to have sufficiently high amount of energy so that it can go for this uh, electron and positron formation. Like here we can write this interaction as gamma leading to the formation of uh, minus 1 e 0 plus 1 e 0 where minus 1 e 0 refers to the electron this one refers to the positron. And therefore, uh, the mass that is getting produced if we do the calculation then total corresponding energy has to be something like 1.024 MeV or 1.02 MeV and uh, hence this photon must have at least that level of energy. So, that we can have this pair production phenomenon. The, this is graph shows the possibility of different uh, each of these three phenomena depending upon the energy level of the photon. When the energy level is low it is the photoelectric effect which is more dominant when the energy level is high we can have the pair production to be dominant Compton effect is uh, dominant more or less in this in between portion. So, uh, similar to radon we can have also problems with the gamma ray radiation and also we can receive significant amount of environmental effects because of arsenic and also uranium. So, considering all these effects we have to be definitely very careful to while dealing with this mill tailings. And uh, another factor to consider here is the large volume of tailing that we are getting. So, while the concern as I am repeatedly telling while the amount of radioactive effect that these tailings are correspond, tailings correspond to are is quite small maybe just about 5 percent of the total effect that we get, but still the volume of the tailings uh, consumes 9 more than 90 percent of the total waste material and therefore, we have to be very careful uh, about how to 
dispose that. Earlier, they need to be disposed to any kind of uh, location without being bothered about the corresponding radiation effects, without being bothered about uh, putting any effective containment and uh, generally some kind of topographic depressions were employed like say a valley which behind a ram or dike, a custom built ring dike, a mined out pit from where uh, all the material has been uh, taken away and therefore, the pit needs to be filled up with uh, something. and uh, uh, mill tailings were also used there as that some as a part of that something. The custom built pit or repository can also be an option and underground mine can be an option. They have, even in a live mine also you may have lots of empty spaces which uh, or lots of empty tunnels which we can uh, fill up. We need to fill up with some kind of material. So, there also the tailings can be employed or used to get employed and the deep lake or river. But as time goes on we kept on getting more and more information and uh, also had a better idea now about what we should do to uh, or exactly how we should dispose these tailings. So, from there came the concept of this tailing pond. The tailing pond is uh, generally the large structures where the uranium mill tailings are generally deposited. Uh, but while selecting one tailing pond or designing a tailing pond, there are several factors we have to be careful of like the required storage capacity for the tailing and waste rock. Uh, of course, it is just not for one year that we are going to store it, we are going to store it for a few years and so the total storage capacity corresponding to the entire lifespan of the reactor should be considered. So, another can be site availability, the location for this should be quite close to the uranium mines otherwise there will be chances of spreading of radioactivity because of uh, transportation. Hydrology and hydrogeology can be a factor as the water that is flowing in the local areas uh, should not pass through the tailings otherwise this water itself will get contaminated. The initial cost we would always like to be low and the ease of operation is definitely needs to be considered. Finally, the geotechnical and geological conditions can also play a big role. And at the end we have the complete engineering design uh, which will design the tailings, design the, the mill of, of and also the entire uranium circuit. If all this can com be combined together then that can lead to, an, lead to a very very efficient methodology of tailing disposal. Present day methodology corresponds to tailing management facilities called TMF. Um, these are uh, isolated locations from where the tailings are kept for a very very long time. They are generally located within mined out open pits or in surface uh, impoundments which use the geographical feature and uh, features and man made barriers. These are the new this is the new factor that is coming in because even before the even earlier days also even before also this kind of mined out pits or surface impoundments were in use. But nowadays this man made barriers or man made protection systems which are introduced to keep the, uh, keep the tailings within a certain boundary and also to restrict the corresponding radiation effects. Uh, the ground water and surface water also needs to be diverted from the tailings to prevent any kind of contamination. This is one possible kind of design where you can see the water is there and the tailing is below the water at this particular portion we shall be having some kind of separation um, so that the water does not come in direct contact with the tailings. And the waste rock are the at the follow or from the bottom surface, and uh, then water is also allowed to flow through the tailings in order to take the heat generated inside the tailings, and then that can uh, pumped out for some kind of treatment. The their tailings are always generally deposited under water to prevent them from oxidation, as it is not allowed to come in contact with air, so it doesn't get oxidated provides uh, shielding from radiation from the tailings and also as the water layer is there. So, even uh, the dust is not allowed to flow away from the surface of the tailings. Tailings are deposited in the TMF as a slurry, the solids settle in the TMF while the liquids are later collected and processed through a water treatment plant to remove the contaminants. The resulting effluent must meet regulated quality requirement before it is allowed to be discharged into the environment. This is a possible uh, flow sheet for this effluent treatment. The effluent that we are getting that goes through a series of reservoirs, each of the reservoirs own role like um, in this portion radium is separated, 
uh, Mn is precipitated in this particular portion, uh, pH is corrected in this particular tank. Accordingly, uh, the, the effluent is allowed to go through series of uh, chemical actions and so that finally, what we what comes out or what is going to the staling ponds is much more safer compared to what we have started with. And uh, along with the tailings, we also have something called the waste rock because when you are harnessing the uranium from the core uh, from the mines rather along with the ores lots of rocks also will be coming out. And uh, some of those rocks will be clean rocks where some others will be mineralized rocks. So, we have to get rid of this waste rocks also. Uh, the clean rock can be used for construction activities such as the construction of roads etcetera, uh, whereas the this mineralized rock it can be used depending upon what kind of mineral content it has, it can be used in certain chemical industries or in similar kind of industries or it can uh, be deposited on impermeable pairs also, seepage and runoff from the mineralized waste rock piles are collected and processed through a water treatment plant to remove contaminants before they are released to the surrounding. So, both waste rock and effluent requires uh, treatment, but the treatment methodologies are generally quite uh, standard. So, this is the typical nature of these tailing ponds uh, as uh, I have mentioned earlier we may have water in these portions and then the tailing below and you can see the this particular cross sections how many layers are there. There are several layers of protection to separate out the water and the tailings. Uh, this, uh, this table shows the composition of all this water, this is just for your information, so I am not going to detail of this, you can take a look at this table and get a better idea about different layers. But uh, what is important is this tailing ponds can have three kinds of designs, upstream, downstream or center line depending upon the orientation of successive dams. In all the cases, the dam starts with a starter dike or starter dam. In all the cases, the first one is a starter dike or starter dam, uh, which is uh, the starting point. And then on top of the starter dam, we uh, add more and more uh, dams. In case of upstream dam, if you look carefully, we are moving into the upstream direction, means uh, more and more dams are towards the inner side. Whereas, in case of downstream direction, we are moving towards outer side and again uh, dams are proposed in that direction only. In case of uh, the upstream dam, while we are going in the upstream direction, in case of uh, downstream dam as you can see we are moving in the downstream direction, whereas in case of center line we are moving straight upwards. So, different dikes are added and as we are continuously adding dikes we can change the height of this, but each of these three categories have their own advantages and disadvantages from construction point of view. Like the upstream one generally is quite low cost as uh, we are adding the upstream dam sites. So, just by adding this dike we can keep on increasing, but the issue is the height can be limited and also on what or what is below this second dike that is only unconsolidated slimes which takes some time to consolidate. So, the structure can be a bit can have its own issues particularly if it is subject to some kind of earthquakes. The downstream side trailing dams here. Uh, this is the starter one and see how we have built the second one or the third one on top of them. This is definitely much more stable design, a very very safe design both from static loading and seismic loading point of view. But the issue is the total volume of the dam or the amount of sand required to raise this uh, dam wall. Here uh, like if we go back to the upstream design, all this uh, number 1, 2, 3 all of them look more or less the same and therefore, the material required for each successive dikes are more or less the same, which is not true. Here whatever is the volume of the starter one, the second one is having slightly higher volume, third one is having even higher volume. So, as we keep on adding more and more layers, the volume is increasing accordingly the cost will also be increasing. And first is the uh, last is the center line uh, tailing dam, here the volume requirement for can be quite large. Whereas, um, so the total space requirement also will be quite high. Whereas, in case of center line dam, as we are moving straight upwards, it can be raised quite quickly and smaller sand volume required compared to the downstream trailing volume, but unstable slope, uh, slope can develop in, volume in the newer structure for this. So, each of them has their own advantage and disadvantage, and all the three types of tailing ponds are in use, all the three designs are in use, 
in different parts of the world. But of course, the designer should be very careful about uh, choosing the type of dam they are going to use. Total vo expected volume of radioactive waste say from 20 years from now or 30 years from now also should be taken into consideration. So, today's lecture I am keeping up to this where we have discussed more about the tailing ponds or different kinds of nuclear waste classifications we have done and uh, tailing ponds. Now, can you guess under which category these tailing ponds are falling? They are definitely low level wastes, may not be a very low level, but definitely low level wastes which are which are very high in terms of volume, but very small or very uh, not I should not say they are uh, insignificant, but the total uh, radioactive dose is quite small. So, in the next lecture which is going to be the final lecture of this course, we are going to discuss about the other types of radioactive waste particularly the intermediate and high level radioactive waste and their possible methods of disposal. So, thanks for your attention for the day, see you in the next lecture.